Hello, everyone. This is Paul Tinkle. We're on this week's 30 Minutes program. Here in our studio today, we have two doctors of pharmacy. And I'm very pleased to recognize these two men who together have approximately 100 years of being a pharmacist. My guest today, Mike Swaim and his father, Van Swaim. And the two have been recognized as Tennessee graduates of pharmacology and also of the University of Tennessee Health Science College of Pharmacy. Mike, tell us about the terrific honor that the University of Tennessee of Health Science of College of Pharmacy brought this opportunity for you folks to be recognized in their magazine this past fall. They did a great job on their story. And uh, anyway, I kind of made us reflect back and realize that we had been, it's been 99 years. I've never had another partner in the pharmacy business. So uh, we've been very blessed. Now, may I call you Van for the rest of the program? Okay, so I don't don't want to be disrespectful by any means. But both of you are doctors, and both of you have degrees from the same university. UT Pharmacy School in Memphis, yes. And what set you on fire to go and become a pharmacist, uh, Van? Well, I lived in Greenfield, and the next door was T.G. Caldwell, who was in partners with uh, the Blue Drugstore. And uh, he had encouraged me, and uh, uh, Morris Ballou had started inviting me to go uh, uh, when they had pharmaceutical meetings and so forth. They'd hold up at the lake and so forth, and uh, it got me interested in it and encouraged me. And uh, so when it came time to make a decision of uh, where you kind of want your career path to go to, I just thought, well, I think pharmacy would be good. Now, what, what put you into that, you know, what made you want to go to pharmacy school? Well... Uh, they had uh, told me it was a profession, and when I went with some of their meetings, I got to see other folks and saw that they were involved in the community, and a lot of them were on the Chamber of Commerce, bank boards, and it just kind of opens the door uh, for you that uh, there are other opportunities out there, and uh, I just thought, well, rather than count pills, it might open the doors for something else for me, so it encouraged me, and I just made that decision. Tell me about your mom and dad. Well, my father uh, was Carrie Swain, and my mother was Mary Frances. And uh, he started off uh, with E.N.J. Brock Company over at Greenfield as a salesman. And then they, uh, two things, uh, E.N.J. Brock, uh, Mr. Mosley, uh, started Ford Motor Company. And uh, Dale Overton's daddy started running that. And then he went across the street and opened up International Harvester, which sold farm all tractors. And so he moved my father over to that as manager of that. So when I grew up, I grew up in, in the ag, ag business, so to speak, uh, with tractors and so forth. And then my father branched off and uh, started getting in heavy equipment. And we started building uh, secondary roads uh, up in Kentucky and so forth. And uh, that was... Uh, when uh, he gave me a job of being the grease monkey. Mm-hmm. So I got to change all on the bulldozers and the earth movers and the road graders and uh, get them greased up every morning. And uh, back then we had barrels in the back of a pickup truck to carry our diesel fuel, but we didn't have any uh, way of filling it up except by hand with hand pumps. So I'd get up early in the morning and go to the big barrel and uh, – uh, pull the truck up to get uh, the fuel transferred over uh, into the pickup truck barrel. And then we'd go fuel up those dozers and so forth. So I, I grew up kind of in that construction end back then as a kid. And then he put me on a bulldozer. And we were stripping clay up in Gleason uh, for one of the clay companies. And back then it was strip mining. And uh, I, I said, Pop, how much are you paying those drivers? And he said, five dollars an hour and I said well, I'll tell you what I don't think I'm gonna go to college five dollars an hour I'm making 75 cents uh, at the grocery store and he said oh I don't blame me he said yeah uh, come on so he put me on a bulldozer in the bottom of a clay pit in the middle of July and August at a hundred and something <laughs> degrees <laughs> About September, I said, is that offer still open about college? He said, yeah. He just smiled. And uh, so from then on, I I knew my direction, and it wasn't going to be in construction. Did you play basketball or football? Mm -hmm. Played basketball, played football, played baseball, all at Greenfield. Were you pretty good? Now, you see, 
I, I played at the same time that Dale Orton played. Oh, you know Dale well, don't you? Well, you see, when I threw the ball in to Dale, I never got to touch it again. <laughs> he shot every time I threw it into him. <laughs> so, uh, so it, it was a short layoff for me, yeah. but uh, we, we weren't really that good back then. But uh, football is what I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Tell me about meeting your wife. Oh, you won't believe this. Uh, I had uh, graduated from pharmacy school, and uh, I was working at a store down there, and uh, three other boys and I were, had a house together, and one of them was from Martin. Well, my wife was Shirley Grooms, and Back then, O.K. was married to, married to uh, Bonnie, and he was in med school. Shirley had gone to college for a year or so, and she decided she didn't like it. She wanted to come to Memphis, I think the beauty school or something. So Bonnie, O.K.'s wife, said, oh, you need to just come. we got an extra bedroom. You just stay with us. And so she did. So uh, the boy that was living with him, Martin, said, hey, Let's go. Bonnie and I are good friends, and Shirley and I are good friends. Let's go over to their apartments. So we started going over and talking to Bonnie and OK, and I met Shirley. And once I met her, 60 days later, we were married. That's a little quick, wasn't it? It was quick. And it stuck. It stuck for 59 and a half years. (laughs) You know, it's amazing um, how relationships begin, you know. and, And where was she from originally? She's from Martin. And you were from Greenfield and didn't know each other, had didn't. to go to Memphis to meet one another, right. and then came back here and eventually settled in. in right. And so let me let me stop back here for just a second. So you chose to go to pharmacy school. What was that like? Well, you know, it was different from anything I'd experienced. You know, when you go to this regular college, you go to this class, that class, and you, you're with all different people. When you go to pharmacy school back then, you started out as, as a, a P4 is what you call it. And everybody, it was about 90-something, I was maybe 100 in our class, and we all went to the same class together. We were always together, whether it was uh, uh, in, in pharmacology or whatever, we, we were all in that together, and we, we developed our friendships back then. And uh, there were only two fraternities, Kappa Psi and Phi Delta Chi. That was the only thing that separated any of us, is depending on which fraternity you got in. These were professional fraternities mm-hmm. back then. So uh, you, you just kind of really got to know your classmates better. Mm-hmm. If you just tuned in, Van Swaim is with us. His son Mike is also here in the studio. We're talking about um, the history of a van pharmacy story, and I'm going to come to that here in just in a couple of moments. I'm very interested uh, about, are you the oldest in the state of Tennessee practicing medicine as a pharmacist? I think Mike checked with the state board, and there's two others that might have license older than mine. So I think I'm number three, and I don't know. How long ago was that, Mike? And and I, I don't, we don't know whether those other two are active in pharmacy or not, but there's two older licensed than he is. Mm-hmm. Does that make you feel... A special way, maybe. Uh, you told me you're 82 years old now. Is that oh, right? thank you. I've got about 85. I'm going to be 86 next month. 86? <laughs> yeah. I know. In the month of April? March. I'm sorry, March? Okay. March the 15th. Yeah. Eyes of March. So you you finished your, your schooling. You got your diploma. Mm-hmm. So what did you do with it? Well, I was working, and then I met Shirley. Where were you working now? In uh, Mullins Drug Store in Memphis. Okay. And uh, we got married, and I don't know, you know what a soda jerk is. Sure. You know what that is? My I, mom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Shirley was a soda jerk at P&S Drug Store when she was in high school. So after we got married, Clint Wash and Roy Harris, do you remember those two names? Sure. And they many, own, many people of our listening audience. Okay. Uh, they own P&S Drug Store, and they went down the street and bought Holloman's Drugstore. Mr. Holloman wanted out, and they bought him. So they contacted Shirley, and they said, would you be interested in talking to Van and seeing if y'all would like to move back to Martin? i got to have another pharmacist. And uh, we talked about it, and at that time, uh, we started having some children. And uh, How old were you then? Uh, well, I graduated in 61, and so I was... From pharmacy school? From pharmacy school, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was about two or three years after that. 
And we decided we didn't want to raise our children in Memphis. Busing was going on and a lot of things were going on. So I said, yeah, let's let's go to Martin. Mm -hmm. So we did. And um, I said, now, Clint, Roy, this is the thing. Uh, I'll come work for you. But if you buy anything else, I want an opportunity to buy in. I don't want to just be the hired help. So sure enough, uh, I got started and uh, we uh, started uh, – I don't remember whether you remember Dr. Tom Wood. Uh, he was from Martin, and his practice was in uh, Paris. And he called and said, we're building a, a Eastwood clinic, and we won't put a pharmacy in it. And uh, so he said, Roy, we all be interested. And so Roy said, do you want to be a partner with us in it? And I said, yeah. So we did that. And then Clint later on had some heart problems, and uh, he had to get out. So I came back and uh, bought P&S. And Roy went out to the medical center pharmacy that was had Dr. Thurman, Dr. O.K. Smith, Dr. Hobart Bill, and Dr. David Smith in it. And then when he got ready to retire, I, I bought that. And um, so it just kind of expanded from that through the years as I had opportunities and mm -hmm. so forth. You mentioned four children. Mm -hmm. I have Mike, the oldest, Mark, Ron, and Roger as my youngest. So I have four boys. And none of them but this one wanted to be following in your shoes of being a pharmacist. Well, you see, the smartest son I've got <laughs> is the third one. <laughs> now the fourth one. <laughs> he married a doctor. <laughs> so uh, let me segue here for just a couple of moments. Uh, you come back to Martin, and the world has changed with pharmaceuticals. Every night I'm watching television, there's going to be a, a something on that relates to, I got to go get this, I got to buy that, I got to get this, ask your doctor, tell your pharmacist, blah, blah, blah. You get all of this. I mean, we're inundated with medicine. Right. And there's a whole lot of stuff that's out there today. I mean, to me, the latest uh, that I've been paying attention to is Ozemic. And I don't know if it seems to be the number one weight loss, uh, but it's not really for weight loss, but it is for... It's for diabetes. Mm -hmm. But it has a real good side effect in that it, it makes you feel like you aren't hungry. It stimulates a, a hormone. Mm -hmm. I believe it's in the liver. And it tells you, well, I'm not hungry, so you don't eat as much. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I've talked to some physicians that have put their patients on it, and they say it works great if it's used properly. Mm -hmm. You lose the weight, and it also controls your sugar. And it is the hot button right now. Well, you know, I'm going to follow that up by simply saying you have seen so many uh, prescription medicines, and now they're no longer prescription. They're over-the-counter medicine. What's happened in all the world here now? You know, I have to answer that. Much. Well, it, they've just made e easier access to, to medications that, that aren't specifically dangerous. Uh, pseudoephedrine, allergy cold medicine that used to be, you know, that now they've, they've realized that it's really not dangerous, can't be abused that much, and so they've, they've allowed it to, to ease up. You know, you two gentlemen have uh, a great admiration of children, and there's no doubt in my mind that you love kids and have loved children and watched them grow up and so forth. And it's sad that we have had to come to a prevention coalition. I'm sure I'm glad we have it, but we have weekly county prevention coalitions in Obion County and so forth. And today the biggest issue still seems to be uh, kids getting involved in, egg, in, in, in uh, drugs at a very early age. And I know as a pharmacist, both of you feel the same way. You know, you don't want those kids to have drugs. No, you don't. Yes, Paul, it, it is a problem. It, it, it's definitely, but it, you know, it usually starts off with something other than your pain pills, which is where it ends up. It's usually a progressive thing. But uh, obviously in our business, we've seen a lot of it. It is sad. It's mm -hmm. bad for our community. Well, you know, fentanyl is a hot button right now. Uh, that's what you like. Now, for cancer patients, we have fentanyl patches, which work great. But when you take the active ingredient out and you mix it with a little heroin or cocaine or something, it's a tremendously potent drug that uh, causes a lot of damage, a lot of deaths. Uh, so uh, some of those people are, are really smart out there on how to do all that. You know, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I do know that you're very passionate about making sure that people, whoever gets uh, a script, that they're number one 
that they get it and use it like it's supposed to be. You didn't put it on there three times a day for a week and then you're done with it, but right. it, go ahead. Well, compliance is important. Uh, some of these drugs have half life for what we call. That's how much when they're metabolized by the body in the thing. So if you don't take it properly, you either get too much or else you don't take it often enough and it runs out. So you lose the effectiveness of it. And some of these things you have to take and build up to a steady state for it to be effective. And then you want to maintain that so that you get the maximum benefit out of it. Mm -hmm. Mike, what are you telling kids when you're talking to them? High school uh, students and so forth. Uh, obviously, a part-time gig, I, I run into a lot of students. Just, you know, stay away from drugs and alcohol. They're, they're not good for you. And just be be careful. Use 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 good judgment when, when being around that. It's just nothing. Your relationship, Van Swaim is with us and his son Mike also here. We're talking about uh, the... The legacy of uh, Van Swain, for all practical purposes, they've together almost 100 years of uh, working in uh, pharmaceutical and uh, Van's Pharmacy. I grew up with Van's Pharmacy here. Uh, I know my mom and dad appreciated their relationship with you. I've said this in circles, but never on the air, but uh, I appreciate the good care that you gave my father when he was dying of cancer. And uh, I'll never forget uh, my mama saying how much she appreciated Van and... Uh, you know, and I don't. I'll, I will never forget that. I, I follow that up with this: How has it changed? How has medicine changed? You know, since you came to Martin. Oh, the technology and so forth, and the, the potency of some of these drugs, and uh, it, it's it's a moving target. And and we we're finding new drugs and new things all the time uh, on that, uh, Paul. Uh, I, science is great. Uh, and, and it's helped mankind. When you look at the average age, say 50 years ago, uh, what a male and a female live, and now you look at it today, and you see, I, I forgot what I looked, it's like 74, 76 years is the average age maybe for a male and a female, maybe a year plus or minus of that. And years ago, what were we talking about, the late 50s, early 60s? Uh, so modern medicine has done great in longevity. You know, the technology that's taken place over the last few years, you you know, your doctor says, okay, I'm going to give you a script. He either, either calls it in, texts it in, or he emails it in. And by the time you leave the doctor's office, you go to the pharmacy, it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just to do. I mean, actually, doctors don't even write prescriptions anymore. They're all done elect electronically now. You mean they, they don't have that little... Pack, uh, pages where they just write, you know, you can't read the scribbling, you know. <laughs> it's all sent electronically now. Everything's electronic. We get all of our prescriptions in at our institutional pharmacy electronic now. And so it, it, that's just a, a new way. You don't see any, any written prescriptions anymore. Van Swaim, what, what was the hardest uh, difficult thing that you've had to do with technology, whether it learned to use the computer or maybe some of the other things and maybe putting together medicine? Well, Paul, I'm still learning. Uh, of course, I'm out of retail, and we're an institutional pharmacy. We'll talk about that in just a second, but go right ahead. Okay. And so, we, like, like Mike says, everything comes in electronically to us from the doctors and, or from the homes that we service. Uh, they're sent in. And then we have two robots that fill probably 70% of our medicine uh, robotically. And uh, so it, it's a science that... Uh, we have great technicians that know how to run it. I don't think I could go in and run one all day by myself, but I've got some technicians that know it inside and out. Mike, uh, you want to share with us, uh, with our listeners, uh, what institutional pharmacy is and what it does here throughout the nursing home industry? Sure. Well, and I'll give you a little bit of background. When I got out of pharmacy school at 86, I didn't really want to go to work for him in the retail business. I wanted my own deal. So uh, I got involved in institutional pharmacy for about three years uh, outside of that, and then went into uh, the retail store, and then we branched out. But institutional pharmacy, we don't service the public. We're called a closed pharmacy. It's a little different licensure, a little bit of different rules and laws by the state. So we service inpatients, which are nursing home, assisted living, uh, group homes, uh, any type of uh, licensed or home that has a, uh, a population like that. So if my great-great-grandmother is in the nursing home, um, here, let's say Weekly County Nursing and Rehab Center, that her medicine would be coming from institutional pharmacy yeah, in correct. Martin. Uh, it would be whoever they've got contracted with. Uh, that's the type of facilities that we service. We actually mm -hmm. service from uh, 
the whole state. We have some facilities in East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, Memphis. Uh, so it's just, you know, everybody, can, they have a right, the facility has a right to contract with anybody to do that. But that's the type of facilities and the type of packaging that we provide. Mm-hmm. It doesn't come in bottles with a label on it. It's a, it's a single-dose packaging type thing. What's the biggest change you have seen in the pharmacy industry, Van? Oh, me. Uh, there's been so many changes through the years, Paul. I don't know that I can call anything. Uh, is it paperwork? I mean, is no, it it's, more? It's an more absence of paperwork. It is all computerized, everything. And, uh, you know, you you have to keep records so far back. And used to, I can remember years ago when I first started working at PNS, we had to keep the prescriptions. And the way they kept them, they took a coat hanger and they straightened it out. And they threaded the prescriptions over the coat hanger until it looked like a beehive. And then they would hang them up in the attic. And we just had rows of hangers full of prescriptions mm-hmm. uh, on those things. Uh, and now it, it's all computerized, electronic, and so forth. And, Paul, just the, the medicine, let me believe you, the medicine itself. When I got out of pharmacy school, there was probably between 500 and 1,000 different medications. Now there's 5,000 or, or six in our store. Uh, the medications have become so specific. An antibiotic is for a specific type of infection where years ago it was just a broad spectrum. Uh, same thing with seizure medications, being on type, the type seizure, the type diabetic. They're very, very specific. So there's a lot of new medications that have come out over the years. That, that's to me, has been the biggest change. It's just how specific these medications are. I've got to believe, <clears throat> Mr. Swain, that you don't have as close a relationship with the doctors that you did 30 years ago. That's right, because you don't see them. It all, it all comes electronically. Uh, we deal more with our nurses, just to be truthful with you, uh, because that's what you go through. It's either that or a nurse practitioner uh, that, that you deal with, that, that oversees some of these facilities we deal with, that makes the decisions, that that's who we ask for the refills and so forth. And it's all done electronically. We don't usually call many of them. We just send an email to them, and then they respond. There is always that temptation, <clears throat> excuse me, there's always that temptation where somebody wants to go into, uh, they want to start a business without a license. <laughs> Just want to see you know, where I'm going with this. But, you know, these drug guys that come out there, uh, that people have stolen medicines, uh, they have uh, maybe stolen from a pharmacy and so forth, and they got all of these meds. And I don't know about you, but... I get concerned when I hear about, you mentioned the word fentanyl just a moment ago, and, and we could talk about cartels and other things, but in a big picture, that those meds that may have been in somebody's pharmacy are not there t- tomorrow morning because they had a robbery. How how tough is it nowadays to make sure that no one can break in and get meds that are very, very important? Well, we've been fortunate, I guess, in the uh... 38 years that we've been partners in multiple pharmacies, we've only had three break-ins that I'm aware of. So it, it is more and more difficult, but the record keeping we have to keep of, from the time it leaves the manufacturer to it gets to the patient now is some of the new federal guidelines. It's, it's pretty protective. Has the federal, federal government been overreached sometimes in pharmaceutical, or does there need to be more reached? Oh, I, th- I don't have any problems with it like it is. Uh, we have good, strict laws, and we abide by them. Uh, I can't think of anything that they need to do any different. Uh, we have reportings and and so forth to them that we keep up with. Uh, we're inspected by the state every year, uh, and we have to comply with all their regulations and so forth. I've got to believe insurance has got to be kind of a problem nowadays. I'm hearing more and more things that aren't covered in some of the are. Can you speak to that for a moment, either of you? Well, insurance, yes, it is a problem, and it's just due to the high cost of medications. I mean, the, the cost itself is, is cost prohibitive in certain situations to insurance companies to be able to do that. So they just make stricter rules where you have to have a certain diagnosis. The doctor has to go through certain steps to get certain meds covered. So it would be just like that Ozempic you're talking about. Uh, it's a $1,000 medication a month. Uh, does insurance want to pay for that uh, for an overweight person? Do they see the benefit of it? Some do, some don't. Uh, Obviously, for a diabetic type 2 patient, then it would be uh, advantageous for them to pay for it to prevent, uh, you know, long-term hospitalizations and, and circumstances like that. But Maybe a crazy question to ask. What's the most expensive drug on the market today? 
Oh, it'll be some of those specialty drugs that we don't handle. There's a there's a drug out that's ninety thousand dollars a month for muscular sclerosis, cystic fibrosis. There's some really expensive ones. Uh, we don't. They ha- actually have specialty pharmacies that just deal with that specifically. But there's some really, really, really expensive drugs that are that are very uh, uh, diagnosis wise are very specific for a certain ailment. How long do you think your daddy's going to work? <laughs> Till he dies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as long as he can, as long as I'll let him. So, so sincerely, uh, how long do you want to work? Oh, as long as I'm mentally able and physically able, uh, I, I get up in the morning and look forward to it. Right now, I go and start Monday and uh, in Friday. I do take off Saturday and Sunday, uh, but uh, I go in early and get the robots fired up and the computers and so forth, and uh, take care of it and get it ready for the girls to show up at eight o'clock, and then I come. But, you go have a cup of coffee, and I come back and work to three. You know, it, it would appear it, it, as being a doctor, but as it would appear as though you have helped thousands of people, and yet now some of those are no longer with us, and you're, you've outlived them and didn't think you would, and all of a sudden you're here and they're gone. There's an emotional connection with the patient. I don't know how to describe it, but I have a, you know, I have a great connection here with you folks, and I mean, I, I think the world of you. But I know that when you're a pharmacist and you've been helping someone for years and years, and this is, goes back to when you were in uh, the public business, so to speak, it's, it's, it's got to be tough. Well, yeah, I look in the weekly county press every week and look down the obituaries and see how many of us are left. And uh, just like uh, my high school class, there aren't many left from the 1956 class uh, at Greenfield. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's, it's just that way, and you just have to accept it. Mm-hmm. Advice for somebody who wants to go into the business of being a pharmacist. Mike, what would you tell them? Well, it is a great, great profession, and the reason is is that uh, you get to help people. You, you, you're blessed with the opportunity daily to help people, and not all jobs are that way. And uh, we've been blessed that, uh, you know, there's not a day you can lay your head on the pillow at night that you hadn't had the opportunity to help somebody in the pharmacy business. What's the biggest change? You mentioned technology a little bit ago, but you talked also uh, about your wife and uh, the relationship. And you go back 50, 60 years, we're talking, and you're talking about how you you come up to the counter and you get a, what was it called, phosphate? Uh, Do I have the right language here? And to make a Coca-Cola or whatever it happens to be, the days where you had, you know, the pharmacy also had soft drinks and other things. Am Am I not correct? Yeah, you know, every, all pharmacies used to have a soda fountain. And then if some of them even had curb service where, you know, you pulled up outside and someone would come out and take your order. I want a milkshake and a, uh, a banana split and so forth. And they would bring it, hang a tray on your window, and you'd eat and you'd toot your horn when you were through. And uh, they'd pick it up. Uh, so all those days are gone. <laughs> Mike, I'll give you the last word. Well, I just... We have been, and I don't want to stress this, we have been so blessed. We've been blessed by this community. I've been blessed by my, my mother and father, and we've been blessed. Uh, we've been blessed to have this opportunity to work together, and I know you had mentioned you had had partners that you hadn't had a conflict in 40 years, and we've had differences over the last 38 years, but uh, we've never had an argument. And it's the only partner I've ever had. been very blessed. He's taught me a lot, and we've worked well together, and we've had a great time for almost 38 years. Congratulations on – a hundred years. So that's what you're approaching right now. Being a father, son with 80 years of experience in this business. It's incredible. And, uh, I appreciate the, uh, uh, university of Tennessee at Martin and, uh, and Bud Grimes uh, helping me with a particular piece of uh, information that was helpful. And that's UT, uh, college of pharmacy. I, I, these folks are terrific down there. And I know you recommend them highly. Yes, we do. So thanks so much. And, uh, this has been a really eye opening and yet at the same time, kind of a, uh, going back in time to spend a few extra minutes and thinking about uh, what it was like to sit there and get on that bulldozer and make a decision to go to college. It's a good thing you were there that day. You may have, you may still have been out there on that bulldozer. You're right. <laughs> it's been my pleasure to visit with Mike Swaim and his father Van Swaim, talking about their recognition at the University of Tennessee Health Science College of Pharmacy this past fall. And until we see you again real soon, everybody, Paul Tinkle, and this program was pre-recorded.